It was once known as the Switzerland of Africa, but in recent years gained a very different reputation. To reach Mogadishu, we're travelling on a United Nations flight from Nairobi, one of several each week that bring in outside expertise to support Somalia's fledgling government as it tries to rebuild this fragile country. Somalia lies on the Horn of Africa, a key position close to some of the world's busiest shipping lanes. Years of factional infighting have left it divided into three separate regions. Somaliland and Puntland in the north, both of which claim autonomy, and southern Somalia, ravaged by drought and decades of violence. A former British and Italian colony, Somalia has been without an effective central government for over 25 years. In the early 1990s, as the country slipped into civil war, millions faced starvation, and a UN task force led by American troops was sent in to try and stem a humanitarian crisis. This city really came to the world's attention in 1993 in an incident that happened just a few kilometres from where I'm standing, what became known as the Battle of Mogadishu. 160 US Special Forces landed here to capture a notorious warlord, Mohammed Farah Adid. That mission went disastrously wrong. Their helicopter was shot down, and in the firefight that followed, 18 US Army Rangers were killed. Some of their bodies dragged through the streets. Two years later, the US withdrew from Somalia, and that episode became the inspiration for the Hollywood film Black Hawk Down. 700 Somalis also died in the battle. Islamic militants al-Shabaab, an affiliate of al-Qaeda, emerged from the chaos, fighting a bitter insurgency against the government and African Union troops. Along with Islamic extremism, Somalia also became a byword for piracy. In 2012 alone, Somali hijackings cost the shipping industry $7 billion. Six years ago, al-Shabaab was pushed out of Mogadishu and the international community stepped up efforts to support the country's transitional government. So are you, you twisting it this way to me? You need to twist it As part way. of that, the UK has around 85 military personnel stationed here across a range of missions. Some work with African Union peacekeepers, while others directly train Somalia's army. And despite the dangers, they believe what they're doing is making a difference. I think it's because we're smaller teams here. We're nothing like the, uh, the Operation Herrick or the Operation Telex, where we're regiment size or battalion size. This here is more very small supporting teams. So you do feel like you have got a bigger spread of responsibility, but you feel a lot more comeback for that. It's a lot more rewarding. You see the difference. You can feel the changes that are going on. So it is very much a uh, different to a different operation to anything I've done, but definitely feeling more reward from this than I have in any other operations I've been on. Despite the continuing violence, the officer commanding the British mission here says the country is moving in the right direction. There are two things that you know I hear, uh, I hear you know, back in the UK about Somalia, you know, one of which that it is on the precipice, the other, which is phoenix-like, you know, sort of rising from the ashes. You know, actually, neither of those two things are true. It's nowhere near the precipice. Uh, but equally, we're not seeing a phoenix-like rise. You know, in truth here, uh, what we're seeing is a, is a steady, medium-term progress. There might be a little bit of a sine wave within that progress, some ups and downs. But, you know, I've had the opportunity here to speak to many, many Somalis, or indeed people who've been here longer than me, that say that over the medium term, it's really, really different. I mean, we could not have been stood here having this conversation, you know, five years ago without a considerable more threat than we're facing today. We're heading to Baidoa in central Somalia, an important trading and political centre. It's home to 130,000 people, including tens of thousands of internal refugees. Here, serviced by a small landing strip, is the camp where British soldiers are training the Somali National Army. Al-Shabaab still have a lingering presence in this area, and all transport is in bulletproof vehicles. Around 10 British personnel are based in Baidoa, training the SNA in basic military skills. These are junior staff officers, most come from the town itself, and will soon, it's hoped, be running a newly built operations room here helping to coordinate the battle against al-Shabaab. Basically, we're giving them a lot of um, low-level infantry skills at the beginning because um, we we're trying to implement, implement a, uh, a soldier-first policy. So just to give them the skills and drills that they need to be able to um, command their troops on the ground. From there, we'll take them forward and uh, we'll take them into basic planning considerations um, and into planning cycles, briefing points, um, leadership, um, 
human rights. We have the UN who are going to come on board uh, next week to deliver a piece on uh, human rights and gender sexual violence and uh, quite important themes here in Somalia. Um, that will then progress even further up to a live ops room serial at the end of the final week, um, in which case we can actually test the officers to make sure that they can run the ops room and uh, actually deliver the planning that's needed for the Brigadier General. Private Abdul Rahman is 21 and translates for the British Army here. He learned his English in Kenya and one day hopes to become a doctor. In the meantime, he wants to help bring peace to Somalia. These guys that are being trained, how are they finding the training? How do they uh, feel about the British coming and training them like this? They are very happy since my country was not having someone to care about. They help us, they are friendly, they care us, they give us whatever we need, you know, justice. They are our support. I will really, really thank for, for them. Inside the base, the remnants of Italian colonial rule, once ornate villas ravaged by time and war. This is home to 60 Division of the Somali National Army. Corruption is an underlying problem, and today these troops are here for what's called verification, a periodic check to make sure that every soldier on the payroll really does exist. In charge of 60 Division is General Yarrow. He told me he commands 4,000 troops and has been fighting al-Shabaab for a decade. Malka, al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab are weaker than before, and what they do is bring misery to our civilians. They're not even human. They're an unbelievable group of people who do whatever they want, and we'll continue to fight them. How beneficial is it for your soldiers to have British troops here training you? This training and capacity building means we can mature as a division. Before it disintegrated during the civil war of the 90s, Somalia had one of the largest militaries in Africa and a fully equipped air force. Studies suggest it now has just 15,000 troops. A UN arms embargo imposed 25 years ago means they also lack heavy weaponry. The ban was eased in 2013, but the general tells me his troops still lack basic equipment. No, we can't get enough. No weapons, medicine, bullets, simply not enough to fight. It's the biggest problem we face. If that embargo is lifted, we'll get the weapons we need to clean up Somalia. If Somalia gets good support, we can achieve peace in five years. Within five years? The British approach here differs from other training missions around the world. Not only are they offering mentoring, but UK money is also going into bricks and mortar and small stipends to try and provide a wider, more encompassing level of support that will keep this army functioning as it tries to rebuild. So the first thing we're doing there is we are creating a, a headquarters and that really is to enable the commanders to make sure that they can effectively look after the Somali soldiers that we're training. And what that looks like is turning what is essentially a chicken shed into a, into a smart sector headquarters with a communications capability and an operations room that allows us to mentor the headquarters. Thing number two would be that we are creating a training facility. It's roughly the size of sort of six English football fields. Um, and that will provide us with the capability to train concurrently two Somali subunits, about 120 each. And these will be um, you know, simple units, equivalent-ish, I suppose, to an infantry company that can essentially shoot, move and communicate. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, and this is brand new to what's happening in Somalia, is that we will create a barracks, uh, a series of barracks actually, to make sure that when the soldiers move out of their training facility and deploy, right now, where people have done that before, they've sort of melted away into yeah, Baidoa, Mogadishu, Kismaya, wherever it might be. There's been no focus for them, there's been no leadership. Um, we will feed them, look after them, lead them, house them, and essentially provide that extra bit of security. Take cover, return accurate. As larger numbers of troops are trained here, it's expected that more British soldiers will be deployed to Baidoa. For the Somali army, this UK mission, which is costing millions of pounds, will be a vital step on the road to re-establishing itself as a professional military, one that eventually can stand on its own two feet and take the fight to Al-Shabaab. So once that's come down now, we'll go for the next one exactly the same and then bond them together again. They call this area the Dust Bowl, a small corner of Mogadishu Airport that until a few years ago was a killing zone for Al-Shabaab snipers. Now it's the place where British troops, here with the UN, teach African Union soldiers the basics of combat engineering. 
how to build blast walls, barbed wire defences and today two-man trenches. Well, yeah, so a lot of them we've been speaking to, uh, they come down to this dust bowl here where we're teaching and they remember from when they couldn't even walk across here and they used to have to run across here and that was just as early as 2007. So when we are interacting with them on breaks and stuff, a lot of them are on their second, third tour of Somalia, uh, hard working and uh, yeah, they've got a lot more experience than um, some of us that are out here. So the sandbag fits underneath it. Several dozen British soldiers are here in Somalia with the UN teaching and advising African Union troops in a range of military skills. Their commanding officer says this mission, called Op Katan, isn't without its dangers, but the rewards are high. I think what we need to do is really be cognizant of the, that there is still a threat here. You know, there isn't a, a freedom of movement across the country. We have to be very careful and, and take a lot of precautions in the places we go and be aware. But at the same time, we're making considerable progress every, every day and every week as we step along this mission. So the great building up the sort of strength of the Somali National Army in order they can take over some of Amazon's role and start to get this country back to being up on its feet again. On the other side of the Dust Bowl, more British soldiers are teaching basic motor maintenance. These African troops have vehicles. What they lack is the ability to maintain and repair them. And in a nearby depot, I was shown the result. Dozens of rusting armoured personnel carriers now going nowhere and cannibalised for parts. The UN as a whole uh, have a, a large issue here in Somalia. Uh, the equipment degrades very fast. If you look behind me, some of the vehicles there, uh, they're not that old, but they're degrading very fast, rust and all that sort of thing. We realise that the equipment's coming in way over, way over its service date. Our, our way of battling that was to start educating uh, some of the members of the UN about uh, level one maintenance, um, how to look over the vehicle and do what, as, as the British Army call the first parade. First parade being looking over your vehicle before you go and make a journey or on a daily basis. Going further into the future, what we're trying to do is get these vehicles in for service and on a regular basis so that they can be maintained properly. The African Union mission to Somalia, known as AMISOM, began in 2007. Currently, there's more than 20,000 troops in the country from five neighbouring nations. Uganda has the largest contingent at just over 6,000, followed by Burundi and Ethiopia. Kenya has around 3,500 troops stationed here, while tiny Djibouti has sent 960. Many of the troops the British are teaching have completed several tours of Somalia. These Ugandan motorised infantry were keen to show us their new vehicles, provided by the US government. Corporal Mahusi Emmanuel joined the army 12 years ago, and this is his fourth time in Mogadishu. Uh, I'm sure now Al Shabab has no power anymore, like he, for the last back years. We have tried to repurpose him, only that now few remnants have remained within the town, disturbing us with IEDs. Uh, some minor cases are now registered by Al Shabab, but actually we have tried very hard to overrun Al Shabab from Mogadish town. We can easily work out what the breathing rate is over a minute because we times it by six. The exact number of African Union troops killed or injured in Somalia has never been fully revealed, but one study put it at more than a thousand. It's one of the reasons these lessons in combat medicine, much of its skills the British Army used in Afghanistan, are so valued. All we try and do is we try and cater to scenarios within a, a hostile environment, uh, gunshot wounds, uh, IEDs, mortars, um, so that they have uh, more medical preparedness to deliver uh, in the field should they need to. Next procedure is, could you read that out please? In another part of the airport compound, more lessons. This time soldiers from the Royal Logistic Corps teaching these Ugandan quartermasters how to supply an army. Among the RLC troops here is Sergeant Ibrahim Bigger. Originally from Ghana, he joined the British Army 12 years ago. And for him, returning to Africa is particularly rewarding. Uh, that, that's exactly as, as, if, as if hit on the point. The question understanding because of the diverse nature of African clan system, because I've got that background, it helps me in uh, building a rapport with um, the guys we are training. I, personally, I usually play football with them, with the locals as well, in Mogadishu. So it's, it's, it's not us, it's, it's, they make it look on the media. So you've enjoyed your tour, have you? I've, I've absolutely enjoyed it, and it's, it's, it's been an ex experience for me as well. In their compound inside Mogadishu Airport, Italian troops prepared to venture into one of the world's most dangerous cities. While Al-Shabaab were forced out of the capital six years ago, they still terrorised this city. IEDs and suicide bombs 
now a favourite tactic. These paratroopers are here in Mogadishu, protecting a small European Union training team as they visit various government buildings. And one of their commanders is a British officer. Conditions out there, there are certain districts you wait, go through and you'll wave at the, the people that go past and they're very happy to wave at you and smile at you and give you the thumbs up. There are other districts where people will totally ignore you um, and I think that's just dependent on you know, people's perceptions of you as you go through. Improving lives here can be difficult, but it is slowly happening. This Ugandan liaison officer showed me a project supplying a community with fresh water and toilet facilities. This kind of project is very challenging because at times you find there is no fun. For example, this toilet, this one was uh, actually, the fund, what the fund came from the UK mission support. Because at Hamish Home headquarters, we didn't have funds. So when I approached the, our UK mission support mentors, they responded. And we have the, now the toilet, and the community are enjoying it. Thank you. The UK is funding a range of projects in Somalia, from schools to medical clinics, to try and stabilise the country and turn people away from al-Shabaab. As this RAF officer told me, some of the schemes are simple but very effective. Uh, we put a football pitch in marker, which sounds like a crazy thing to do in a war zone. But what it's done is there are two clans in marker who have been fighting for uh, 20 years, 30 years, probably longer than that. The longest ceasefire that they've had in that period of time has been five days. They're currently on day 25, and what they're doing instead is they're playing football on the football pitch. The other issue that's plagued Somalia is piracy. These Ugandan marines are using patrol boats donated by the European Union. The presence of EU forces, including the Royal Navy, have played a large part in reducing the incidence of piracy. In fact, there's been no successful pirate attacks off Somalia so far this year. The measures taken by merchant vessels uh, to protect themselves from piracy um, has been significant and um, that has been a very large uh, factor in, in how many successful pirate attacks can be taken. So the, the deployment of EU NAV4 protection forces on vulnerable shipping, uh, the establishment of protection measures on ships themselves, um, all of these have a factor towards the reduction in the, the piracy incidents. Somalia is undoubtedly far more secure than it was just a few years ago, largely due to the 20,000 African Union peacekeepers who are based here. African Union troops have now been here in Somalia for more than a decade fighting al-Shabaab and this vehicle graveyard gives you a clear indication of what a toll that has taken upon them. The question now is how long they will remain here in this country. They're due to start withdrawing next year and be completely gone by 2020. Somalia's own army simply isn't strong enough to fight al-Shabaab on its own and the fear is that if the African Union does leave then this country could once again descend into widespread violence. The African Union force reportedly costs more than £600 million a year, the bulk of it paid for by the European Union. But a 20% budget cut has caused friction with the five African nations who contribute, and next month the first 1,000 soldiers will leave. Hey, Mohanga here, Sector 1 Commander. This Ugandan brigadier fought his way into Mogadishu in 2007. He now commands 6,000 troops, the largest African Union contingent. And while we're filming, he receives a call from the president of Somalia about a key town which it's feared is under imminent attack from al-Shabaab. His assessment of what will happen if Amasom do leave is stark. I think we should share this failure by the international community, ourselves and government of Somalia, to have... Uh, not the current government, because the current government is barely in office, it's a few months in office. The past governments we have, fa have failed to put in place a Somali national army. We don't have a trained, unified and professional Somali national army. What we have are still militias. We are looking at a drawdown. Already 2017, one thousand of us are going home, they will not come back. It's a drawdown. And, uh, uh, what will happen is that, uh, of course, the Al-Shabaab will talk over, take over the areas uh, w which we shall evacuate because, uh, as I said before, the Somali National Army doesn't have capacity to hold ground. They don't have the weaponry, they don't have the training, so it's, it's really absurd. It's, it's, it's very bad that we are going to, um, to lose out on our achievements. 
While Amazon says it will go by 2020, some believe the drawdown will have to be more phased to give the Somali army time to grow in capability. But the commander of British forces here says he understands the African Union's frustrations. Yeah, I mean, the situation we're in now is Amazon have been here a long time. Somali progress has been very slow. Amazon are frustrated. You know, what Amazon would like in the ideal world is to see um, is to see a coherent, credible, steadily growing Somali security force that it can transition to as it goes on to do other things. And it's not seeing that because it's not happening. Uh, but it's about to start happening. And I think you know, one of the, one of the um, initiatives here that I was at just a couple of weeks ago is the new Turkish facility down, down the road, which is developing officers. Um, and, and here we are in Baidoa creating a model example. It really is the model. It's the blueprint for how we are going to fix the army, at least in, in Somalia. Um, you know, if you ask for my judgment on how long, how long that's going to take, you know, I think Amazon are here for the medium term. Inside the airport compound in Mogadishu, there's an air of longevity about this mission. The international community says it's here for the long haul to try and stabilise this war-ravaged nation and steer it away from violence. With Islamic State defeated militarily in the Middle East, it sees Africa as fertile territory for its brand of extremist ideology, and IS already has a presence in the north of the country. After decades of instability, this most dangerous of countries is improving. The real challenge now is to hold on to those gains and give this next generation of Somalis a life of peace and security.